Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Leaders. I'm Paul Burton, Northeast Regional Editor for The Bond Buyer, and we've got a good one lined up for you today. My guest is John Boyd, Jr., a principal with corporate site selection firm, The Boyd Company, and we will discuss the role of business in a winning recovery. Lots to explore as we begin to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Hi, John. Welcome. Great to talk to you, as always. Hi, Paul. It's great to be with you. All right. Uh, before we get deep in the weeds, why don't you tell us, uh, tell our national audience a little bit about your firm and the interesting things they do. Our firm was founded in Princeton, New Jersey, back in 1975. We counsel major U.S. and overseas corporations where to locate their facilities throughout North America. We service a broad spectrum of industries. Some of our major clients include Boeing, UPS, Progressive Insurance, Dell, uh, Pratt & Whitney, Royal Caribbean Cruises, and other Fortune 500 companies. Our firm also provides business climate data and operating cost data through our bizcost.com website. The site-seeking companies, uh, developers, market analysts, and the Wall Street and investment communities. Okay, tell us some of the key challenges in business attraction, especially coming out of COVID. Well, Paul, we're living in a time of unprecedented mobility for people and for companies. Uh, of course, the mobility with the with people has to do with the rise of the remote workforce, which was a trend prior to COVID. COVID accelerated the remote workforce trend. Uh, I think we're evolving to more of a hybrid scenario for most companies, given you know, the enormous operating cost savings associated with companies reducing their real estate commitments. And from a corporate perspective, there's a lot of relocation activity happening because of pent up demand in so many projects were put on, on hold during the pandemic. You have cities and states around the country that were ravaged by COVID, uh, out of control budget deficits, looming tax increases, looming federal tax increases, and of course, lifestyle issues. You have uh, record uh, crime uh, numbers in major cities like New York and Chicago and Philadelphia. All of that is forcing companies to do strategic site selection, not only as a way to reduce operating costs and taxes, but also to be in markets that are desirable for work for uh, your, your, your workers. Uh, we live in a global marketplace and companies need to attract and retain the best talent. Okay, so uh, tell us what regions are best poised, uh, poised to best emerge. Well, there's a common denominator among cities and states that are tracking industry today. Uh, most of the winning states happen to be in the Sun Belt. Uh, you think about uh, Charleston, for example, so much of their growth tied to their port and recent investments by Mercedes and Volvo and our client Boeing. You think about Nashville, Nashville's on a roll. Uh, the uh, North Carolina, the, the research triangle, so much exciting life science industry happening in the research triangle. The I-40 corridor connecting the Winston-Salem triad region to Raleigh-Dorham. I-40 is now talked about the way that other premier life sciences corridors, like the 128 corridor in Boston, or the 270 corridor in Bethesda, Maryland, or the Route 1 corridor in, in central New Jersey. Uh, of course, Florida and Texas uh, firing on all cylinders. Out west, Denver, Phoenix, Las Vegas, and Reno have been very successful attracting a lot of the people and businesses leaving California. Okay, uh, Florida's been getting a lot of headlines uh, at attracting businesses. What is Florida doing right? And we should note, this isn't just hedge fund companies from New York, not just retirees, but they're also getting tech people to relocate from California. Absolutely. Florida is attracting 900 people a day. Uh, and, and you're right, it's not just retirees. It's, it's young millennials leaving the Bay Area, leaving New York. Uh, Florida, of course, has no personal income tax, which makes the state desirable for, uh, for a, a, a workforce. Uh, but, but also, you know, economic development success comes down to the stake and the sizzle, okay? The, the stake are the quantitative uh, attributes of Florida, the low cost of doing business, the favorable tax structure, the favorable tort climate, by the way, Governor DeSantis recently did a, a, a very uh, highly regarded tort reform bill that's going to protect the business community from a lot of COVID-related frivolous lawsuits. Our clients really like that. Uh, but it's also about leadership. Uh, the state is proactive on economic development, uh, and, and that matters. 
that, 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 that is very important. And you know, uh, South Florida is, is on a roll. We, we talk about Wall Street South. You talk, you talk about all of the hedge fund and banking industry happening in Palm Beach County. And you talk about Miami becoming a leader in technology. Uh, John Wernger and David Blumberg investing in the tech incubators in Miami and bringing venture capital money to support tech in Miami. But it's really all parts of the Sunshine State. Uh, Orlando, on a roll, you have KPMG, just announced their $425 million national training center. You have Tampa. We talked about Tampa uh, uh, prior to this uh, video, Paul, but some of the most exciting uh, development activity happening in North America is happening in Tampa's waterfront. Jacksonville, on a roll, becoming a premier globe uh, premier place for banking and financial services with Ernst & Young and Macquarie, Citibank, Allstate. Most recently, Dun & Bradstreet relocated headquarters out of Short Hills, New Jersey. And also the Panhandle region. Under the radar screen, uh, six military installations, uh, home to Raytheon, Boeing, uh, Northrop Grumman. I think their proximity to the new Space Command headquarters in Huntsville is going to create a lot of opportunities for cybersecurity, aerospace, defense, and avionics projects in the panhandle in the months ahead. One of the things we talked about the other day, John, and this relates to Florida, is the the spinoff effect on infrastructure. We're going to get a little deeper into infrastructure later on this show, but uh, a lot of people relocating to Florida, as you said the other day, have transit in their DNA, and that could augur well for undertaking such as the Bright Line and Tri-Rail in Southern Florida, transit-oriental development, basically c- catalysts for spinoff development. Right. I mean, the old slogan is, you know, Floridians love their cars, and that's true. But we have to remember that you know, so many of the folks moving to Florida from states like New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, the D.C. area, uh, you know, public transit is in their DNA. Okay, and, and one of the issues Florida will have moving forward, given all of its success, given all of its growth, is maintaining affordability. So we see the bright line and also tri-rail presenting opportunities for new mixed-use developments that will have a, a, an affordable housing component throughout Florida. Of course, we're going to get extensions, uh, the bright line extending to Orlando from, from South Florida next year, uh, and then ultimately uh, to Tampa, which would also create a uh, a new wave of exciting development activity along the I-4 corridor. So it strikes to, to me that the work at home is such a, a, dy- a dynamic with so many huge variables. I want to point out a uh, survey that Newsweek magazine published recently. It was uh, a poll by an organization called Best Practices Institute, and it said 83 percent of CEOs want a full return to the office only 10% of employees do so. And one columnist said a seismic stand, a seismic standoff is building. And uh, the, the variables have ramifications for real estate, mass transit, uh, levels of municipal services, the things we cover in public finance. Such a huge variable, John. That's true. And I think one of the big impacts on the commercial real estate market is that projects are getting smaller where the office is getting smaller. 20 years ago, the average square foot per worker was approaching 200 square feet per worker uh, in a classic office project. Now projects are about half that size. And that has to do with this new model, this hub and spoke model, where the office being more of a space station with rotating employees. Again, that hybrid method that that we see many of our clients uh, getting back to in the months ahead. Okay, and interestingly, Fitch Ratings yesterday came out with a report saying that uh, the work-at-home dynamic is placing, a, a, I think it used the phrase, a drag on the California and New York labor markets. Well, well that, 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 that's certainly true. Uh, you know, these are markets that depend upon a workforce. You think about all the restaurants in New York City or the retail uh, decimated by COVID, by the lockdowns, but by having vacant office towers. Uh, so, you know, we're going to see some you know, immediate economic rebound just just by that virtue of that alone, people getting back into the office, at least uh, whether it's maybe not five days a week, but even you know, two or three days a week. All right. Now, the rating agencies uh, have also chimed in on how politics and anti-business sentiment can derail economic development. That was a huge uh, story in the Amazon drama in New York City. 
and um, it it relates to the credit worthiness of states and cities. Absolutely, Paul. And politics impacts every facet of site selection and economic development, from fiscal policy like taxing and spending, to also the social policy. I mean, how cities choose to deal with the homeless epidemic or crime. All of that has serious implications on corporate site selection decisions. It's fueled a lot of the out-migration away from high-tax markets like Chicago and, and California and, of course, New York, but also the overall tenor that the electorate has with the business community. You mentioned HQ2 and the, the ultra-progressive backlash led by AOC that killed HQ2 coming to uh, Long Island City a, a few years ago. You think about the California legislator last year that told Elon Musk, whose Tesla is one of the largest private sector employees employers in California, uh, she told him to go F himself. Okay, you, know, you compare that with the approach of winning mayors and governors, most of which happen to be in the Sun Belt today. Mayors and governors that view business not as the antagonist, but as a partner in building a, a vibrant and sustainable economy. And, and New York and New Jersey have a, a, a lot of high taxes and new taxes on wealthy people. And you spoke at uh, a webcast hosted by Garden State Initiative about a month ago. And you said New Jersey has a lot of things going for it, but the tax and spend policies are scaring people away. Yeah, and, and last year, New Jersey led the nation in out-migration. According to United Van Lines, they do a, a survey each year. I mean, that's that's not a designation that you want. That's not something you want to win first prize in. Uh, that's an indictment upon the types of policies that come out of Trenton, this never-ending cycle of borrowing, taxing, and spending. That said, there are a number of positive growth industries happening in New Jersey, logistics, of course, growth industry, uh, the largest container ship to ever dock in the East Coast, just docked in uh, uh, last week, the, the Marco Polo. That's an example of infrastructure paying off when we raised uh, the Bayonne Bridge back during Governor Christie's term. The logistics is strong. Uh, FinTech, Newark has become a global leader in, in FinTech given its broadband infrastructure and its low operating costs and proximity to Wall Street. Offshore energy is, a group, is an industry that we're very excited about New Jersey. Now will be home to the largest wind farm just off the coast of Atlantic City. That's really the most exciting develop, economic development thing to happen to South Jersey since casino gambling came back uh, in, in the 70s. And that's going to create a lot of jobs in engineering and new office projects for cities like Camden and also Atlantic City. Okay, let's talk for a few minutes about the importance of public infrastructure to business. I first got to know you a few years ago when you were a lunchtime uh, keynote speaker at the Rhode Island Infrastructure Bank's annual summit uh, at the at the Omni Hotel in downtown Providence. Great event those folks have. And uh, you talked about the importance of states and cities and getting their infrastructure in place and that being a magnet to business. So tell us about, uh, you know, we, before we went on the year, you talked about maybe three projects that are really worth uh, following. And then tell us uh, about President Biden's infrastructure bill, which is going through Congress, uh, Congress, and the take from the business perspective and what clients have been telling you. Well, well you're right. Infrastructure is a key agree ingredient to, to economic development. Our nation needs to compete in the global marketplace. So investments in ports, both inland ports and seaports, intermodal rail, roads and bridges, all of that is important. Investing in broadband and cybersecurity is especially timely given the rise of the remote workforce, particularly in areas underserved, more rural areas that have a lower cost profile that uh, will, will get enhancements in their internet uh, reliability. All of that uh, is, is very positive. And you know, there are a number of, of interesting projects that have a lot of support on the ground that will really benefit from a new federal infusion of infrastructure dollars. If you come to mind, uh, Interstate 87, which will link the high growth Raleigh Dorm Research Triangle to Norfolk and the port there. Those are two of the fastest growing markets in the Sun Belt. Uh, I 11, which is going to connect Phoenix to uh, Las Vegas. Uh, the, the completing that will be very significant. Vegas and Phoenix, the two largest metropolitan areas that are not currently served by an interstate highway system, a direct interstate highway. And of course, the Gateway Tunnel. Paul, and you and I have talked about this a number of times. I think finally getting the Gateway Tunnel project done 
to be part of the narrative of a New York uh, Big Apple comeback. So I, you know, we're excited to to hopefully see that uh, come together. And the and the Gateway uh, Tunnel project has kind of a, a ripple effect on other mega projects in New York, like East Side Access, the uh, Penn Station, Moynihan Tunnel. Uh, a lot of uh, moving parts. Forgive the pun. Absolutely, and, and you know, Vernado is a project that we're especially uh, enthusiastic about, uh, and a lot of the, the revitalization happening around Penn Station. That, of course, will get a major uh, benefit from from the Gateway finally getting done. Okay, uh, let's uh, talk about sports stadiums, uh, and especially you brought up uh, sports betting, which is a new phenomenon, and uh, uh, the relationship of, how, of sports betting to sports stadiums. And I see, John, a lot of dynamics, interesting, fascinating dynamics conversion. Uh, you have uh, mixed-use, transit-oriented uh, development, the sports betting, uh, the growth of industrial office parks, and also multi-jurisdictional battles. You know, our coverage on the bond buyer on, on sports betting, we sometimes focus on uh, the tri-state area in New York, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, and parts of the country that have several states converging, like uh, the Kentucky, Indiana region. And, uh, and even uh, there was a piece in the Washington Business Journal that quoted you about economic development, and it mentioned uh, Richmond, Virginia, possibly interested down the road in making a move on uh, the Washington football team, the former Redskins. Yes, Richmond's currently uh, battling to actually get the training facility for the Redskins. They're battling uh, Virginia Beach uh, to, to see who, who can house that. But that underscores the idea that you know, states view stadiums today no longer as a, a mere sports venue, but as the anchor for dynamic mixed use development projects with a housing component, with a hotel and restaurant and hospitality uh, component. And yeah, and yes, with a sports betting component, uh, the stadiums of the future will, will, will have uh, betting parlors as part of the mixed use experience. And of course, the stadiums, uh, or of course the, the, the franchises view all of these mixed-use offerings as additional revenue streams, and the states love it because it's additional revenue for, for, for tax revenue. Okay, so let's talk about uh, airport travel, and there was an interesting uh, discussion the other day by the uh, Association for a Better New York. Uh, they mentioned uh, business travel. Of course, New York has had a lot of airport renovations going on in the works, LaGuardia, JFK, Newark. Uh, leisure demand uh, is up. I think people want to satisfy their bucket lists. Business travel, and there you have the work-at-home dynamic at play, may be a little bit lagging. Uh, given that Zoom has taken all, of, all, all over the world. And what prospects do you see for business travel making a rebound and when? Well, you know, virtual meetings were reducing the need for on-site business travel prior to COVID, okay? Obviously, COVID has accelerated that trend. But the cost savings associated with doing things virtually when possible are enormous. Companies are in the midst of an economic recovery focused on reducing the bottom line on the cost side of the ledger. So yeah, I think the business travel will be sort of the last element to really come back. That said, there are certain business functions that have to happen on the ground, it's particularly in our business of corporate site selection. Field visits are very important, inspecting available sites. All of that has to happen on the ground. And we're looking forward now to, to getting back into this post-COVID uh, a new reality where we, we will be able to get on the ground and, and do real meetings again. I think Zoom fatigue is, a, is a real, a real thing. You know, that, you know. I also see airports doing creative things like uh, outreach on vaccinations, for instance. Yeah, so airports are you know major engines of commerce, and you look at some of the new uh, redevelopment activity that's, that's going to be happening at JFK and LaGuardia. All of that's exciting. Um, and that's something that we like very much. Okay, uh, let's talk about Oracle and Nashville. And I think you said uh, 
recently. This is one for the ages. I want to get your take on that. And uh, to familiarize our, our viewers uh, with it, there's a roughly $1.2 billion deal that the Metro Council down there approved. We're talking about 65 acres of uh, riverfront land along the Cumberland River, about 8,500 uh, workers. And it goes to the whole thing of corporate magnetism. And what makes the Oracle Nashville agreement jump out at you, John? Well, this was a trophy project, uh, $1.2 billion, 8,500 jobs over the next decade. It's an enormous, enormous project. And it, and it comes on the heels of a number of high profile tech success stories in Nashville with uh, Alliance Bernstein and our client Dell, who has their logistics IT based in Nashville. Of course, Facebook and Amazon have major operations in Nashville. I think also what distinguishes this project Keep in mind, Oracle just last just last year moved their corporate headquarters from the Bay Area to Austin. So they, they easily could have done all of this in Austin. I think doing this project in Nashville really is a great endorsement upon the skill sets and the overall business climate that the state enjoys. Uh, you know, people talk about Texas and Florida not having a personal income tax. Tennessee also has no personal income tax. That makes the state very attractive for a lot of the in-migration we're seeing. Nashville consistently among the top 10 cities in the nation attracting people. Um, and that's, it's all very exciting. Uh, great state and local resources, Vanderbilt, the Harvard of the South, and the Nashville, uh, the Greater Nashville Technical Council does great work in providing vocational IT training for high school students. Uh, that's the sort of thing that we like that distinguishes the Nashville. And it gets back to this idea of the stake in the sizzle. Uh, Nashville and the state of Tennessee have a long history of very effective, proactive economic development professionals and resources. Okay, you use the phrase trophy project. And uh, what advice would you have to the public sector when they're vetting these kind of deals? Obviously, they want the business and the tax revenue, but sometimes trophy projects involve giving away the candy store. How, If you're in the public sector, if you're a mayor, uh, or a city council or a governor, what do you do to strike that balance that's in the best interest of everybody? Well, that's a great point, Paul. And, and there's so much contentiousness uh, around incentives today uh, amongst the, the, the not just lawmakers, but also the public. So it's very important for companies to be very careful during the incentive negotiation process uh, we, we have clawback provisions to protect the taxpayer. Companies need to meet certain thresholds with respect to their capital investments and their hiring practices. But it's also routine now to have a social impact component to a incentive deal to make it more palatable to lawmakers and to the public. Great example, Tesla in their last incentive deal with Austin, with Travis County. Uh, they're going to make a, a forge relationship with Houston Tulsa University. It's, it's an historically black, black college. Uh, that's a type of social impact, uh, uh, part of a well-crafted incentive deal that we're going to see play out. And the other part of that to, I mean, to skeptical mayors and governors is to realize that in incentive packages, especially in high-cost states, are really needed for the state to be, to be competitive, uh, given the high costs and out-of-control spending by, by a lot of your own politicians, uh, quite, quite frankly. Uh, and keep in mind that these Big incentive packages to trophy employers also benefit small businesses in the area. And it's also a catalyst for other types of positive economic development activity. So those are all the narratives and themes that are part of the discussion anytime a hotly contested incentive battle is being negotiated uh, in a, in a, during a, a county or a city hearing. Okay, we've been all all over the country in the last half hour, John. Let's circle back to New York. There's a mayor's election coming up. Uh, in the business community, we had Kathy Wild on, on one of these programs last month, and, and she talked about how the business leaders have felt sidelined for eight years during the reign of uh, Bill de Blasio. What hope do business leaders have that the next mayor, whoever he or she is, will have at least have some kind of rapport with the business side of things? I think this election is coming at a, at a critical time for, for New York. I mean, the narrative is this historic exodus. Uh, with that comes an, an enormous opportunity to turn things around. I, I was encouraged to see the two uh, leading Democratic frontrunners, Yang and Eric Adams, talk about the need for safe streets, 
uh, that's key uh, in terms of restoring confidence with the, the private sector and, and with and with the business community. But I, I'm optimistic on a New York rebound, but it's going to take real leadership. It's going to take more than uh, gimmicks or, or, or marketing campaigns. It's going to take real leadership. And it's going to in, involve having the business community feel like they're part of the recovery. I think life sciences will play a major role in a big Apple comeback. Tech will play a major role. Uh, you look at Facebook and Google and Apple investing in New York, that's obviously very positive. And I think it'll be a, a people first uh, rebound. I mean, uh, New York has historic uh, affordability today with respect to lease rates. So it'll take uh, you know a, a combination of, of marketing uh, as well as real leadership uh, to bring back the big apple. Yeah, despite the problems of the real estate market in New York, some people have pointed out that uh, at least uh, if there's some silver lining in this, maybe some people who couldn't have afforded to move uh, to move into New York might be able to do that now. Absolutely. And cities always have a way of, of, of coming back. I think the affordability quotient, New York's now able to attract uh, the best and brightest from, from around the globe. Um, and, and this idea of you know, the mass exodus, there's a, a caveat there. People talk about Florida as the sixth borough. Economic development is not a zero-sum game, okay? If Goldman Sachs decides to move their asset management division to Palm Beach, where they currently maintain significant operations, uh, that, that'll create efficiencies in Goldman Sachs that could potentially allow them to invest in other parts of New York and other divisions. So that, that's an important part to realize also that economic development, uh, like the economy at large, it's not a zero-sum game. Okay, John, we've covered a lot of ground. Why don't you kindly share with us some final thoughts? I would close I mean, saying that this is really an historic time uh, in our nation's economy and in the corporate site selection business. Uh, unprecedented mobility among people. We have emerging new technologies like the space industry, 3D printing, electric vehicle production, renewable energy. Uh, and, and, and we have uh, this idea of this massive migration of people and intellectual talent to different parts of our country. There's a lot of exciting new development opportunities uh, that are out there in the months and, and years ahead. And also a lot of lessons to lawmakers. I mean, the consequences of engaging in this never ending cycle of borrowing, taxing and spending. John Boyd from the Boyd Company. Thanks so much for joining us today on our leaders program. Thank you, Paul. And thank you for watching, everybody. I'm Paul Burton. Have a good day.